So, so you make a couple of, uh, you, you lay out several principles there in that particular book. You talk about abductive reasoning and you talk about the difference between uh, direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. So can you kind of briefly explain what those are and how that relates to with uh, in terms of the gospels and, and what you discuss yeah. there? Well, I think that sometimes one of the best things we can do when trying to communicate, number one, when trying to determine what is true and then trying to communicate to others is understand that there are time-tested rules of evidence that will help you and processes that will help you to determine the truth of any claim. And so, for example, just understanding the difference between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence the circumstantial evidence is also called indirect evidence. So I'll hear people say all the time, well, you don't have hard evidence for Christianity. You don't have hard evidence for God's existence. As if hard evidence is some kind of a category. It isn't. There are only two categories, and there's no such thing as hard evidence. The categories are direct and indirect. So direct evidence is simply eyewitness accounts. Everything else is indirect. Everything. I just made my first case ever with DNA. We did a press release probably five or six weeks ago now. Um, I, up, up to this time, I could tell you that I'd never had a DNA case. Hmm. It was a case from 1972. My dad was the original investigating officer. Wow. 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 47 <laughs> years later, we solved the case. I didn't solve it. It was solved with ancestry DNA. Hmm. Right. So a, a team of people who work ancestry DNA that we hired actually put the connected the dots. I simply had to find the DNA. That's what my role was. <laughs> well, I can tell you that when we make these kinds of DNA is indirect evidence. It's not hard evidence. It's not even direct evidence. It's indirect evidence. Fingerprints, indirect evidence. Material evidence, indirect evidence. Statements he makes, indirect evidence. Observations of behavior, indirect evidence. If it's not an eyewitness who can testify to what happened, it falls in the indirect category. And that's circumstantial, right? Yes, which means it's all circumstantial. As a matter of fact, I say this a lot, the overwhelming percentage of cases that are tried in America, I mean in the high 80s, is circumstantial and entirely circumstantial for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, if you have an, an eyewitness who saw you do it, or two or three, I would, or you're on video doing it, that's another form of direct evidence because it's like an eyewitness. Uh, if you have that kind of thing, you're probably taking a plea deal. Okay, you're not going to trial. You're only going to trial if it's a case where they don't have an eyewitness and they have to make it circumstantially. So that's why the vast majority of trial cases are entirely circumstantial. All of my cases prior to that one DNA case were 100% circumstantial. So that is, is the kind of thing that um, uh, you learn. And if you know that, it means that you, the bar is different, right? So all the evidence we're going to have that demonstrates the Christian worldview is true is going to be probably in that circumstantial category. So the idea that, well, you can't know something if all you have is circumstantial evidence is simply false. That's what most cases in America, and most of those are won in the high 90s, and they're made entirely on circumstantial evidence. And I've had 100% uh, record on entirely circumstantial. Wow. Well, that's just because that's just the nature of it. And we have to help people see that those are the categories and stop saying you don't have any hard evidence. And by the way, judges tell juries that direct evidence and indirect evidence hold the exact same value in their deliberations. They have the exact same weight. They are told that as a jury instruction. So stop thinking, well, I need 10 pieces of circumstantial before I can get to one piece of, of, of direct. That's not how it works. They're all to have the exact same weight in your evaluation. So we need to stop saying it's just a circumstantial case or all they have is circumstantial evidence because it turns out that's the nature of, and that's, that's to be considered with the same weight as direct evidence. So, so when you look at the gospels then, what are we looking at there with regard to evidence? Well, you're looking at... Uh, so that's a hard one, right? Because I think in some ways that we don't have video from the first century. The closest thing we have are what appear to be two, Matthew and John, that I believe are written by eyewitnesses, and two that are not written by eyewitnesses, Mark, who writes uh, at the feet of Peter in Rome, according to Papias, 
And Luke, who tells us he's writing after having, now that makes sense he would have eye con a contact with the eyewitnesses because he's in first person in the book of Acts when he's with Paul. Paul, like Luke, like everybody else in that first century, had all kinds of contact with the other eyewitnesses, with Barnabas, with all kinds of people, and they could discuss what they had been told. And he tells us this in the first chapter of Luke, that he is not an eyewitness, that he is writing after having investigated carefully, he says, and he writes an orderly account of what he has learned. Okay. I, I, I like the theory that, that Luke is writing kind of the court papers that he's passing on for Paul at his, at his trial. Yeah, Caesar. that's right. I, I've heard that theory, that kind of way have been, been stated before as well, but regardless of what the occasion is that would cause him to write to this most excellent Theophilus, <laughs> uh, whoever that person is and why ever it is that Luke is writing, the question is, where does this fall? Right? So, so I would say this is, is indirect evidence in, 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 in Luke's case and, and probably in, but if we're just going to consider it in terms of what is it recording, well, then it is recording what is allegedly an eyewitness account. Now, because we can't cross-examine the witnesses, this becomes what we call hearsay, right? So in other words, we want to be able, to, uh, anyone who's accused has the right to cross-examine people who are accusing them. So you can't come in and say, well, you know, my sister said he killed, she saw him kill. Well, well you want the, per did you see him kill that person? No, but my sister told me he did. Well, I need to talk to your sister then, okay? <laughs> right. You're one person removed. This is hearsay. You need to, I, I need to be able to cross-examine your sister to see if she holds up. So what, what is it, the problem we have with these accounts is people will say, well, they're here. But look, history has a different level of proof standard than does a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, we try to raise the level so high that we would rather let, you know, 100 guilty people go than wrongly convict one innocent person. So we have a hearsay rule. So you can confront your, your, your uh, accuser. But if this was applied to history, well, then you could never know anything about history beyond the generation of the people who are living that history. So clearly the standard has to be different for history. And as far as that standard goes, I think we can reasonably call these eyewitness accounts. So the gospels then would qualify as eyewitness, even even Luke and Mark. You would you would suggest? Well, and there are people who will argue that there are some uh, uh, areas of civil law, for example, where these could be included as a. But I'm not going to argue that. I'm just going to say, look, I this is how I start my cases. I get a, a notebook. As a matter of fact, I've got several sitting behind me here from cases I've had over the years, um, and this big notebook is red because it's an unsolved. And I open it up. And there are usually a number of, there's the crime report, there's the death report, there's going to be a, a CSI report, there's going to be an autopsy. And then there are going to be a number of supplemental reports in that notebook that were taken when detectives back in the day interviewed eyewitnesses. Often, I don't have access to those eyewitnesses anymore because they've died. And there are times when I don't even have access to the report writers because they died. All I'm telling you is, how do I determine what happened four decades ago, when I have no access to the original eyewitnesses and no access to the people who talked to them, but I do have the reports of those interviews, would I have enough to be able to make this case to figure out what really happened? Even if I couldn't put it in front of a jury, would I have enough so that I could have confidence that I know what happened? Well, yeah, there's a process. This is what I try to describe in cold case. Let's just be fair. If we apply that process to cold cases and we're confident that it gets us to a conclusion that we can trust and then incarcerate someone for the rest of his life or put them on death row, why would we not be able to use that standard to determine whether our eternal future uh, can be, uh, you know, rest on the information in, in the Gospels? I think you could apply it. What, what, what other way would you? Have? And again, once you've worked with eyewitnesses, it does give you the protection of not having to jump to theories to explain things that you start to see in cases from just 30 years ago. I'll give you another example of this. It's often said that the authorship of certain books is, or they'll say there's more than one author because they'll see differences in either the original language or maybe in the pacing of the book or some critical element of the book that pops up and some words are used in the last half of the book that aren't used in the first half of the book. I get all that. Um, I have cases though. I'll give you an example of this. I had a case from years ago that was uh, actively worked for three years before it went cold. In the first days of the first officer who was assigned the case, he would come back and he would either type on a typewriter 
And because of the technology, if you made a small mistake, he would not necessarily like if we make a mistake on the computer, we can rewrite the entire sentence. Right. If he made a mistake, he would say, oh, it's not perfect. He'd change a few words. He'd keep on typing. The next day, yeah, he'd go out and he'd investigate something. And then he would come back and he's in the press. For, he would ask our secretary, can I just recite this to you? And she's on typewriter. She's much more facile. And he's just saying what he did that day. And she's just updating the report. And she's got, it's, it's going to sound different because she's actually more literate than the detective. Okay. <laughs> and uh, three weeks go by and he can't work anything else, but then he gets a chance to work it again. He goes back out and he does something and he comes back and now it's a different steno. This goes on for three years. By the time I get it, it's a hundred page report, but it was not written at one setting. And it turns out a different steno was used over the course of the three years. If a thousand years goes by and a literary critic then retrieves this report, I guarantee you they will assume that there's more than one author hmm. because the technology changes over those three years. Different technology from the typewriter to the steno, who's just repeating it, sometimes he would record it. And then he wouldn't even be there when the steno would take the recording and make it into the report. And those stenos had our permission to fix our grammatical errors. Hmm. Hmm. And they would. Man, it's a better. Right. We're good, but they made us sound better. Now, look, the same thing happens in ancient documents. We don't know how long some of these were written over time. It's clear that Paul has got a steno. He's got a, a scribe, a writer. In many of his reports, he mentions the name of that writer. He signs off and says, this is in my own hand. Why would he say that? Because the rest of it's not in his own hand. The rest of it is something he's either reset. Do we know how long he's done? Is it all in one setting? You sound different. If I answer the same questions with you tomorrow, my answers will probably sound a little bit different, right? Even if you said, okay, let's just stop right here and pick up the second part of the conversation tomorrow. I might use different words tomorrow based on what's in my head tomorrow. If I wait three weeks, it's even going to be more dramatically different. So I think we just can't draw assumptions, large uh, overarching assumptions that would discredit the reliability of any ancient manuscript when we still have open questions about the time span in which it was written, did he have any help as he was writing it? What kind of technology in terms of what's the surface he's writing on? What kind of ink does it allow for corrections? Does it allow for me to go back and back up and say that again? These are the kinds of things we have to keep in mind, even with documents that are just 30 years old. Can you imagine if we're talking about a document that's 2,000 years old? Yeah. And you're facing persecution and you're, you know, the, the, you're the you, 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 yeah, you don't, you don't have a, a flashlight to, to, to go by this. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in antiquity that, that uh, yes. we now, take for granted today. Comes, it's back to that definition of inerrancy. So you're telling me then that there are documents that might have been in some way limited by the text, by the process of recording or writing and the technology available. Why wouldn't, well, God would overcome all that. Right. Well, again, I think in the end, what he wants to achieve are documents that are real and are testable and have the earmarks of reliable testimony. And I actually think that, 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 that these, these um, um, uh, characteristics of the ancient manuscripts are what gave me most confidence that they were actually recording something true. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you can speak towards the kind of the supernatural aspect, if, if you get a, a case within your wheelhouse today mm -hmm. and someone says, you know, uh, you know, I saw a, a, a demon push the guy out the window or yeah. uh, there was an angel that came by and, and you know, sh uh, shot the person. How, how do you, you know, it seems like you would have to take those claims seriously today because you're looking at New Testament documents that have fantastical claims and the whole idea of uh, you know fantastical claims require fantastical evidence how do you how do you deal with that today and and kind of how do you answer that objection i get this question a lot surprisingly um, oh, darn i thought i had something original <laughs> yeah, people will say it this way well you're not if you're investigating a case today you're not going to jump to supernatural explanations so in your work, you never jump to supernatural explanations. Well, I will tell you that I'm working on a series right now where we're actually addressing this very issue. But, but it's not as though as a Christian I am, uh, or as a not well, as a believer, I am not opposed to looking at supernatural explanations. I'm not. I mean, how could I be and be uh, honest about my approach to Scripture? Do I believe it or not? Um, the idea that there is an invisible world and that there are forces, personal agents. Invisible personal agents in the world acting 
is a concept that's in scripture on the pages of the New Testament. So what I would do now, I just have never had a case though. Again, what I do living in a material world with this invisible uh, unseen realm is that I first exhaust what's in the material realm. That's, I would expect anyone doing this kind of work to first exhaust what is available to me as in the material realm that God has created. And if I get to the end of that and there's no explanation in the material realm, then why wouldn't I be able to be willing to jump to an immaterial explanation? I'm somebody who's a dualist. I believe in such things. My problem is in my work, I've never exhausted the material realm without coming to a suspect. Mm -hmm. So what can I say? Now, I'm looking for cases right now in which you could exhaust the material realm and the best explanation is something immaterial. So, So I think they're out there. But right. the question is, you know, where are they? What kind? What nature would they be? And who, who's in a position who could really investigate such things to be? Well, I have a template. I'm not going to share it with you today because we're still working on this. But it's a template in which would help us to exhaust material explanations. Mm-hmm. So I see as Christians, we're not going to jump. Look, I'm somebody who believes that the DNA that guides all of the formation of biological systems and processes in your body is best explained by a personal agent who has given us the information which we find in DNA. Right. But I, I won't go there if I can find some material cause. The problem is that sometimes you just, the, the best explanation is immaterial and intelligent. So for example, I always say it this way, if I've got a death at a scene, I'm not sure how this person died, but they struck the ground in such a way that they cut their head and there's blood spatter on the wall. Sometimes that blood spatter won't really help me because it doesn't tell me how they were thrown to the ground or how they got on the ground, but it can tell me something about the geometry of the strike on the ground and knowing enough about physics and chemistry, the chemistry of blood and the physics of that blood spatter, I can maybe account for why there is spatter on the wall in that way. I can uh, offer a material cause. But if I get there and there's not blood spatter, but instead in the victim's blood, it says he deserved it written on the wall. (laughs) Am I really going to stop and say, well, how do I explain that with just physics and chemistry? No, (laughs) I think it's reasonable at that point to be looking for a personal agent. And so I think there are, as a, as a Christian, I'm not somebody who says I'm going to jump right away to the fit, to the personal agent. God did it. God did it. God did it. I'm I'm going to go through a process that gets me there eventually. But I, I want to know because I, th- I believe that God is the creator of this environment that we live in, and we are. To, and we're told in Romans one that there's evidence of God in our environment. I, I just feel that's where I start. I start. In the, I'm a physical being, so I'm best able, I think, to start with physical processes. But once those are exhausted, I think I can go to personal agency, or I can go to some other form of non-material cause. Um, in cold case Christianity, you uh, suggest to people to control or suspend your presuppositions. Don't be a know-it-all. Let this evidence speak for your, itself. D- doesn't this uh, lend some some good benefit that uh, presuppositionalists have by saying, if if you're presenting, uh, uh, you know, metaphysical or supernatural claims to an unbeliever who doesn't have this ability to um, to, to to claim non naturalistic realm you know, how do we, how do we speak to them then when, when it comes to the supernatural, when, when we, when we make the claim f- from, you know, did, did Christ rise from the grave? O- okay. Well, you know, uh, in an evolutionary world, uh, you know, or the quantum flux, things can pop in and out of existence and Jesus so happened to time it perfectly for, for that to happen. I mean, I, you know, it isn't, it d- doesn't, doesn't the controlling or suspending our presuppositions I, I, to, to what degree can, can we honestly do that? Oh, well, it's a couple of different questions you're asking there. So yeah, I think that all of us have opinions and we don't expect to put jurors in, in place who don't have strong opinions. The question is, can't we ask them, are you able to suspend your bias or suspend your beliefs or to suspend whatever visceral emotional reaction you might be having to something in the, in the case in order to judge as fairly as you can. We, we get it that, that there are no such clean slate robots that are available for us to do jury, uh, to impanel jury. So we get that. So we have to kind of work within the context of people who have opinions and who have experiences and have desires and, 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 and preferences that, that they're going to actually be part of their decision-making process. We get that. Um, so I think that's so that, that part of it. I don't think you can, but the real issue becomes, okay, so, um, 
when you ask about presuppose, I'm trying to make sure you're, you're asking. So, so if you're, if you're, so ask me, just ask me that question one more time in a way that, so what about presuppositions do you think is the issue? Yeah. So, so for, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, C.S. Lewis in his book Miracles says mm-hmm. that uh, to to talk to somebody who doesn't believe that miracles are possible, miracles will never be possible because their worldview doesn't allow for God to enter okay. or for, for supernatural beings to yeah. enter into an, a natural world. And okay, so- I understand what you're saying now. I, yeah, so what I tried to do, and this is what I actually did for myself. So I talk about this. My process into Christianity was kind of backwards. So I, I got to the point where I'm like, wow, you know, I, this every way you could test these gospels, they seem to be able to hold up to scrutiny and they appear to be reliable. Okay. That for me seemed like it was, I could check that box, but I still would have said, uh, but, but the, the miracle stuff, uh, that's, that's where I have a stretch. Okay. I'm not quite sure about that. So that's what caused me to think about my own commitment to naturalism, my own commitment to the idea that everything in the universe could be explained with the stuff that's in the universe, space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. Because in that construct, if that's all we're working with, then everything we observe has to be explained with space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. And I ended up doing the work that I had published in a second book called called God's Crime Scene, where I just talked about, well, look, we've got good reason to believe that there are immaterial causes and features of the universe that cannot be explained from the stuff that's in the room of the universe, space, time, matter, physics, and chemistry. Look, we already know we're in a universe that has a beginning. The best scientific work demonstrates this. This causes all kinds of people to jump to all kinds of cosmological theories. How do we get a universe from nothing? And what they believe is that all, from the science, that all space, time, matter, comes into existence from nothing, not from a prior temporal void. Not There's no space, time, or matter before the universe comes into existence. Now, think, but wrap your head around that for a second. That means that the first cause of the universe has to be non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material. We already think there's a, 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 th- a force out there that is not of the natural realm, given that we think the natural realm, by definition, has space, time, matter acted on by uh, physics and chemistry. There's something out there that's outside of that, that is the first cause of the universe. Not only that, we experience immaterial realities like consciousness and free agency that are either entirely elusive, there is an illusion, as Sam Harris believes, because you can't explain them if if all we have is this physical deterministic universe Mm -hmm. that explains material things like brains, but it has a difficult time explaining immaterial things like minds. Yeah, we just, in we other just words, recently covered that in an episode of, of our podcast of Sam. Good. So, so that's good. So you've already kind of. So my problem is, is that look, we already are, you've already bitten into this apple that exposes you to immaterial causes and immaterial realities. The only question is, are those personal or impersonal forces? Hmm. If they're well, personal, and I think DNA tells us the story about whether they're personal or impersonal. I think that moral truths. All moral obligations are just that. They're obligations between persons. If there are objective, transcendent moral obligations, there must be an objective, transcendent moral person. You're not morally obligated to physics. You're not, and physics could never give you moral obligations. Right. So I think in the end, there are good reasons to believe that those immaterial realities of the universe are personal. Well, that now, okay, now I can go back to the Gospels. Because if there is a personal being that can create everything from nothing, walking on water is small potatoes. <laughs> everything else falls as a subset of Genesis 1, which is the most impressive miracle on the pages of Scripture. Hmm. Everything from nothing. Yeah. Uh, if, if you want to know more about uh, what Jay Warren Wallace is talking about, uh, see the podcast, uh, uh, Cape to the Cross Apologetics. We recently covered all, all this. So yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're talking about this now is, is uh, you know, d- does, does, a, uh, does morals or does ethics require a, a person or values uh, to, to be a valuer? And, and how do you have uh, a, a values w- without uh, people or more than one person. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you think about that, that's really, it's, and there's only a couple of ways to ground them. If we do, first of all, not every atheist agrees that there are objective moral truths to begin right. with. Yeah. But those who do think that there are objective moral truths have to figure out a way to ground them. Uh, because there's only, you know, there's only subjective and objective. And if it's all a matter of personal opinion, well, that's a subject. If it's a matter of group think, 
like cultural consensus. That's a group of subjects. Those are both subjective explanations. Sam Harris actually offers a, a better alternative, I think, which is that it's grounded in the objective nature of human beings. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that is transcends all of us is our human nature, that for us to thrive as humans, we adopt a code that is really there to help us thrive. It, it's just a reflection of what uh, helps us to thrive. But of course, the problem with that is that he has to import uh, a certain notion of thriving, of well-being. Right. Yep. Because if all he means is survival, all kinds of bad stuff can actually, as a matter of fact, you, the three of us are talking right now because somewhere in our history, somebody acted very poorly to make sure their tribe survived over another. You and I are both examples of how bad behavior can help us to thrive. We can't live here to thrive at all if not for the bad behavior of our ancestors. So I think we have to define what do you mean by thrive? And then you import things you haven't earned yet, right? Because you have a notion, a very loving, uh, sympathetic, tolerant notion of what it is to, to thrive as a human. But where do you get that notion? Why is that true for us? Right? Well, as you can't say it helps us to survive. The most tolerant, loving people were usually in history the victims of a group that is thriving better now because they victimized the, the pacifist. So that's the problem is that you cannot get here from there. Great. Yeah, well, I, I had to at least ask you one presuppositional uh, question because as presuppositionalists who appreciate evidentialists, I know that you share... Uh, especially on your Twitter, a lot of presuppositional links, which I absolutely. appreciate. So, yeah, absolutely. I don't yeah. think that I'm not polarized on this issue. I, I think that each of us ends up dipping into the other. We all end up with a, uh, a palette that we paint with. And on that palette is classical apologetics approaches and evidential apologetics and presuppositional approaches. And, and, and we all paint from that palette. Now, we might say, well, I like blue better than any other color. <laughs> but most of my stuff is major blue. Okay, fine, great. But I, I, I'd be lying to you if I said I don't dip into the other paints. I paint with all the colors. And, and I do that, uh, although I might have a preference for one of those colors, I do use all the colors. I think we all do that. I mean, yeah. I'm a presuppositionalist sometimes, like, but, but I, I, when I get to Mormonism and my Mormon friends, I have to go become a very strict evidentialist because those are presuppers. All the Mormons are not evidentialists. They're presuppositionalists. I've, I've, I've always wanted to, to tell Frank Turk, so please pass this on. When he titles his book, Stealing from God, I, I want him to, to uh, term any time that he talks about uh, a morality claim when he talks to groups stealing from presuppositionalists because he becomes a presuppositionalist there. <laughs> well, so. we all, well, we all do. And I think that's, <laughs> that is important, but, but how do I get there? In other words, to say that um, these characteristics of the universe are best explained as having emanated from the mind of God, when I'm making that case in God's crime scene, I'm using evidence mm -hmm. to explain why a presuppositional view is a better view to take. And I think you'll find yourself doing that on occasion when someone pushes back. Yeah. And actually, especially, it's almost always in the realm of objections that presuppositionalists become evidentialists, right? So if you say, hey, the Bible best explains this, and someone says, well, you can't trust the Bible. It's been transmitted, you know, for, for centuries, and no one even took care of the transmission of that thing. Well, suddenly you're going to point to the evidence for the reliability of transmission of the document, right? right. right. To, to right. be able to show why this presupposition is, is worthy. You're not just going to stop and say, well, no, 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 I don't care what you think about. You're, you're actually going to defend against the objection using evidence, probably. Yeah, yeah we, we have, because we, we both believe in uh, the authenticity of Scripture, we're, we're able to give an answer uh, from, from Scripture as well as make the other side give, give an answer as well to, to make that explain right. the evidence or, or at least yeah. their claim. So, yeah, yeah I agree. You, you know, yeah. we're, we're, you, you use various colors on the palette. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's why my Twitter page, you know, that all, the, all my Twitter is, is the top 15. I follow over 800 blogs every day on my phone on an RSS reader. I scan through all of those blogs from reliable sources and I try to find the top stories, the top articles written about apologetics, mostly from an evidential perspective, because that's who I am. But uh, and also because that's the like 80 percent of the writers. I mean, if I'm honest with you, there's not a lot of presuppositionals who are writing online. There are a few. I follow them and I post their stuff, but but there's not a lot. And so it's like, okay, so I post what there is. Yeah. But I post all of it because I think what's not uh, sightly is the, the, um, the dialogue between presuppositionalists and evidentialists. It can be nasty. It, absolutely. 
Yeah. And, and I don't know if you guys have noticed this. It's almost <laughs> always a little bit more aggressive coming from the presuppositional side. Yeah, I think it's unfair to say. Mm-hmm. But that's I, I, I think that's very fair to say. Yeah. yeah. So I'm looking at that and saying, okay, we just need to, I, I, I need to honor both sides. I'm not going to get, I, I, I squelch any negativity toward presuppositional apologetics on all of my social media platforms. If you're going to say that, you're going to get blocked mm-hmm. because I just don't think that that's a becoming dialogue. It doesn't, it doesn't become us just to, 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 to say, well, I like blue and you're not even saved if you're using red. <laughs> that's what I hear sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, like, and, and, okay. You know what? There's that's, that's not going to help anybody. Right. And I don't think that's true. And, and there are times I you know, my book, uh, Frank's book, Stealing from God is much like my God's crime scene in that we both, make some we're defending why we presuppose what we presuppose yeah um and we want to be respectful of your time and uh th- thanks for coming on but i i i, I need to i need to uh, bookend this with with what was kind of the final moments for you what was the 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 thing i, I i'm i'm sure uh it, it was you know a, a a succession of evidences that got you but what was Kind of, can you can you give me your you know uh, literally come to, come to Jesus moment? I, I, I don't want to ask too, too personal for for you, but maybe what was like kind of the last piece of evidence that clicked, or what was the uh, what, what what would you say would be kind of your moment there? Okay, so I get asked this question so often <laughs> by Christians, and it's because we have. I, I'm just going to make my little. I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to make my little preface first. Is that I get asked this question a lot, and I think it's because we have we we have twisted what the word testimony. But it's really important to us to hear each other's testimony. I know you may not feel this way, but I mean, most average people who are in the church at some point they're like, "All this evidence is fine, 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 fine." Just tell me though, what was your experience? What was your your salvation experience? And I always say, "Why do you need to know that? Why do you even care?" <laughs> I always say, "I'll be honest with you. My transformational testimony." doesn't matter. And either does yours. What matters is, is this true? That's all I should be talking about. Now, it's interesting because this idea of providing personal testimony is very common in the world amongst other religious groups. My Mormon family, they will always get to testimony quickly because they cannot make a case for what they believe evidentially. So they'll quickly get to testimony, personal testimony. And I'm, I'm okay, I, I have a personal testimony. But I think that unless it can be verified by some evidential process, it's just another testimony. And everyone's got one. And I think what we've done is we've taken that word, te- well, the first, te- where's that word used? Well, it's in Book of Acts. If you go through it, people gave their testimony. Right. What was their testimony? Was it about their transformational experience? No. It was about having seen the resurrected, the resurrected Christ, direct evidence. It was about direct testimony. Everyone goes there. Hey, there was a man you all crucified, but he was attested by miracles. We saw him rise from the grave. That is what, when John, when Jesus says to Thomas, blessed are those who will come to believe this is true, who haven't seen me. It's because they will have the testimony of those who have. That's direct evidence. And every testimony offered on the pages of the New Testament is that kind of testimony. The kind of testimony we see in courts from eyewitnesses, not personal experiences. Now, for me, I got to a place where I um, definitely had belief that all that was, was that I believed that the Gospels were telling me something I could trust about Jesus of Nazareth. I was not a Christian. I just had belief that lots of people have belief that doesn't make them a Christian. You got to move to belief in. For me, that's, and I, that this process, I think, is true for all of us. Is that without the good, bad news, like you said, there is no good news. Mm-hmm. And once I read, then I stopped reading it to test it constantly for six months to see if it was telling me something true about Jesus. Once I determined that it was, I started to read it to see if it was telling me anything true about me. That's what changed everything. Mm-hmm. Because once I realized that, yeah, I can trust this author, and he's describing me in a way that is unflattering but true. I knew I needed a savior. And then I knew there was a savior to, 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 for me because I'd already done that work. And that's what made the difference in transition. So it was reading through, you know, the new Testament, looking to see what does it say about Jim Wallace? That is, is disturbingly true 
that then motivated me to do something with the information I had about Jesus. That is the transition, I think, from belief that to belief in that saves us. Now, I, I don't believe that any of this happens because of the high intelligence capacity of the investigator named Jim Wallace. <laughs> of course, it's all God. But what is the what is the, the the what are the words that those who are sent by God are to use with those who are to hear the words? I mean, one of my good friends is is Ray Comfort. I think Ray Comfort does amazing work. But you won't see a Ray Comfort approach on the pages of the New Testament. You just won't. You know, have you ever lied? Well, you're a liar. Have you ever stolen anything? Well, you're a thief. Have you ever lusted after a woman? Well, you're you're an adulterer. That, that's very true. We, it's the bad news presented in a way that we all recognize. We fit the description. But that is not what the New Testament evangelists did. They testified as I, they were selected because they were eyewitnesses. They replaced Judas with Matthias because Matthias was an eyewitness from the baptism to the resurrection. That's what they were looking for, eyewitnesses. And then all of their testimony going forward is eyewitness testimony. And then who gets chosen to write scripture? You got to be an eyewitness. That's what's on the pages of the New Testament. Those are eyewitnesses who are writing those letters. That stuff is powerful for me as somebody who like, you know, I, that, that was I, as an investigator. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Because there seems to be a high regard for direct evidence in the New Testament. I mean, you'll see this. Think about this. If, if I was Jesus and I had a presuppositional approach, when John comes with his disciples and says, hey, John wants to know he's in custody. Are you the one? Well, how would Jesus as a presuppositionalist respond to them? What words would he use to give John? Turns out he doesn't use any of those words. What he does instead is he does three miracles in front of the disciples of John, says, go back and tell John not to pray harder. Not to, no, he says, go tell John what you just saw. That's an evidentialist. So for me, I was like, okay, I can live with that guy. <laughs> and I think that's how God uses, at least how he did in the first century. This is, this is the way the gospel was preached. And so when I share with people, I, I share what is the truth. And we know this by way of evidence and by way of both special and natural revelation. I can demonstrate the existence of God. Also, you're having worked these cases for so many years, I can also demonstrate the fallen nature of humans from both natural revelation and special revelation. These things, if God is true, these things will always match. And so I'm able to use both. Because for me, I just, you couldn't have started with scripture because I had Mormons trying to do that. And I was, uh, that just turned me off to that whole approach. Hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of people. But not for everybody. I'm sure everyone's got different. But I'll tell you what: once you know, like all of both of you have a good grasp of all of the evidence of reasons why you believe this is true. And if you're like me, you're probably sometimes frustrated that most of the church doesn't seem to care about this at all, right? Like they aren't ready to make this case, and they're not even concerned that they don't, aren't ready. Well, that's because you already get it. And I, I think that's that's what where I want my young people for sure. If nothing else, if you've got parents listening to this. If you can become the kind of Christian parent who can actually answer the questions your kids are going to ask from junior high on, because that's where it starts, you'll be in a better place to help your kids overcome their doubts and live confidently as Christians. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we see that in, in the Shema uh, from, from uh, you know, uh, yep. the Old Testament, and it's supposed to continue on today. We, we are the, the heads of the household, and we're... we're uh, encouraged to tell our immediate family first, because those are the people who we have spent so much time with and that we're in charge of. And, and I think that's a, a very important point that, uh, that, you know, wherever you stand in, in the, in the cavalcade of, of evidence or presuppositionalists or apologetics yeah. in general, that, that, uh, that's our, our, our biggest responsibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Next generation. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Detective Warren, I, I greatly appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, I, I'm a big here. fan of, you know, we've got your books and, and yeah. we're going to link them below. Uh, it, t tell me wh where do you want people to interact with you? Or uh, to, to to what what venue do you want them to? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. They can our, our daily work is at coldcasechristianity.com. I, I post there five days a week, Monday through Friday, um, and uh, and our kids' uh, materials are all at casemakersacademy.com. But people ask all the time, 
like, how do I, uh, can I interact? And I'm bombed on social media. So I just created an app that allows people to ask questions. It's just the cold case Christianity app. It's in both the Android and the uh, iTunes store. So you can download that and I, every day before I do anything else, I have a list, a checklist of things I do in the morning. And one of them is to get on the app and answer the questions in the chat room. So, wow. so anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's the place you can interact with me. Yeah, wow. for sure. Uh, yeah, and uh, I've I've got uh, you know m- my father was a, a police officer for 22 years. My my boss right now uh, started uh, the Kalamazoo Portage um, cold case department wow. when he was uh, uh, there, and he became chief of police eventually. So um, uh, you know th- th- this this book <laughs> this book is uh, is is going to be lots of uh, lots of Christmas gifts for for people that I know. Oh, I'm, so. I'm glad to hear it. I hope it's helpful. Really <laughs> so again, we, we appreciate you yeah. and appreciate your work. And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited for the next book and your previous books too. So. Thanks, brother. Appreciate thanks, you guys. Thanks Both for coming. You. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, All right. See you later. Yep. Bye.